Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Byung Ho Jung, and um, from now on, I will walk you through the, um, the oil statistics overview. So um, the presentation will follow um, this um, order here um, from key oil trends, key concepts, and at the end, uh, key points for reporting oil data. First, let's begin with the key oil trends. Uh, here, we are looking at the two pie charts um, um, showing the, the, the source of the energy supply uh, between 1973 and 2020. And even if its share has been decreasing um, since to, uh, 1973, uh, we see here on the left, uh, on the right um, pie chart that in 2020, oil remains to be the still um, the largest source of energy supply at around 29%, followed by coal and natural gas. And this is the two tables showing um, the landscape of the oil production across the globe. Uh, we see that um, there also has been a change in production um, um, scene. So uh, basically uh, in 2016, um, Saudi Arabia and Russia were the top oil producers uh, beginning in 2017 and continuing on to 2021. The United States uh, surpassed them to become the world top oil producer. Um, key oil trends on refining. So um, this graph shows the, um, the output across the most products during the, um, the COVID uh, from 1971 to the um, 2020, where we, are, we were highly impacted by the COVID crisis. And it's obviously um, observed in this graph that in 2020, all the refinery output was declined. In terms of the, um, the growth of in refinery, uh, we can see that clearly that it's mostly in Asia that is producing um, these oil refinery products. And um, again, like in 2020, we've observed a re really sharp decline due to the COVID crisis. Now, when it comes to the oil demand, so after several years of growth driven by non-OECD countries, um, our provisional 2021 data shows World oil demand bounced back like around 6% after contracting by 9% due to the uh, recurrent lockdowns, widespread teleworking, and international travel restrictions, all impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, within the um, final demand sector, um, demand uh, buy sector, um, as expected, we see uh, the large dip in 2020 across all end users. Historically, however, um, road transport has been the main oil consuming sector by non-energy use, which refers to uh, mostly to the use of the oil as feedstocks into chemical and petrochemical industries. Here, uh, a caution uh, that these sectoral demand data are still up to 2020 data. So we, we are not seeing here the recoveries after um, COVID periods, but if the new data for 2021 uh, will be soon released um, uh, for this data collection cycle, which we, we, we expect to see a, a bounce back as we saw the supply side. Key concepts. Um, oil products has been, uh, it's, it's um, classified into several products. Let's first begin with the primary oil products. Primary oil product means that the product hasn't go through the refiner process. So it is the uh, primary source of the oil. So it consists of, consists of the um, crude oil, um, condensates, natural gas liquids, etc. On the other hand, uh, we also have finished secondary oil products. Uh, that are refinery gas, LPG, or naphtha, motor gasoline, etc. Um, here, um, the linkage between these two um, is to, through this refinery process. And um, 
we see that these are the primary oil products. And um, not only this input to the refinery contains uh, crude oil condensates, et cetera, but also it has secondary products into inputs to refineries, such as additive um, blending components or refinery feedstocks. Note that the specification um, defining these various oil products are available in the um, IRS, our manual, or in the oil reporting instructions uh, for those uh, familiar with the joint annual oil questionnaire. Um, just to touch specifically uh, now on the condensates, uh, which are high quality, light and versatile oil, um, needing fewer uh, refining process before using. For example, um, condensates um, can be directly used as a petrochemical feedstock to produce synthetic material. Uh, broadly speaking, there are um, basically two kinds of condensates um, as is reported in the oil questionnaire. First, uh, we call it field condensate that is recovered from associated and non-associate gas fields. And on the other hand, there we also have a type of uh, plant condensate that is recovered in natural gas processing plants or separation facilities. Oil classification can be done also using different indicators. First, we have a uh, density here. Uh, as, as we all know that most of oil is lighter than water, but extra heavy oils have higher density than water. Um, the specific gravity or density of the liquid is needed to convert properly from mass to volume and vice versa. We can also classify oil um, using the, the surfer, surfer content inside. Depending on the degree of surfer content, we can classify between sweet or sour crowd. Finally, energy content. Uh, we uh, normally call it a net calorific values, and depending on its net calorific values information, um, it can be divided into several um, oil products. And uh, as we as we are seeing on the right hand side of the table, uh, we also collect these net net calorific values by uh, flows. Here uh, we are collecting NCV for production, imports, and exports. And using this weighted average, we can de derive the, the final average NCV of that specific oil products. Collecting this information is very essential uh, because it helps us to uh, convert uh, the mass unit of the oil products to uh, the energy units, such as KTOE, <coughs> sorry, or terajoule. And at the end, it has an impact on the calculation of CO2 emission um, inventory. Um, it's a continued uh, slide um, just to show you that show you that uh, crude oils have a wide range of the physical and chemical processes uh, properties and the, the two pie charts here shows that depending on if uh, the, the light or heavy uh, heavy or sweet or sour um, crude oil it has it tends to have a different shape of the um, crude oil and finally, um, it is, um, it is uh, worth mentioning that um, the refinery specification determine the type of input and output uh, of the refinery yields. So uh, it is uh, it's common that this um, reconfiguring a refinery is expensive and not a, always the economical option. So we expect to see a stable and a stable uh, refinery output from one refinery plant or in general, like from the national um, perspective, uh, that is uh, really, really useful for us to validate um, the energy uh, data quality. For example, here we brought uh, refinery yields across the, um, from 2001 to 2015 and looking through this historical time series and this uh, its refinery yield in 2011 we observe uh, a strange or a, a kind of outlier of the refinery yield which um, make us to validate this data to the data pro provider 
Now let's have a look at the oil balance from production to the end user side. So first, uh, because we mentioned that there are two types of oil, for uh, like one is primary oil products and second is secondary oil products. Let's ha first have a look at the supply of primary oil products. First, it all starts with um, this indigenous production. Uh, as we already saw in the, uh, in the other colleagues' presentation, gas, etc., it all starts from this um, production from the reservoir. Um, however, it, is point, it should be pointed out that um, in our oil balance, in our oil annual questionnaire, we always focus on the production amounts of the marketable status. Now uh, we have from other sources, uh, which means that these products are already covered by the other um, fuels. One good example is the biofuels blended into conventional uh, motor gasoline or diesel, diesel oil. And uh, because it is blended with the, uh, with, the, um, with the conventional oil products, we treat them as a, um, we treat the source uh, from other uh, sources, in this case, renewable sources, and we collect this information in our um, questionnaire. And we have imports and exports and stock draw and build just like the other fuels. And this is the specification that oil data has, which is uh, the, the activity of the petrochemical industry. Uh, since petrochemical industry both uh, consumes and also at the same time produces the energy products uh, out of their process to avoid the double counting and to account for properly those values, we have this specific flow called backflows to take into account those amounts um, that are um, uh, coming back to the supply side to be fed into the refinery process or directly sold to the, uh, to the vendors. Uh, we use these specific flows to, uh, to account for um, this, uh, this data. And um, not all uh, primary oil products go through the refinery process. It can be just directly used to generate the heat. And for this, we have a flow called direct use. Products transferred. This flow is, um, is, um, is focused on the products um, that is um, for secondary oil products that have been reclassified as feedstocks for further processing in the refinery without having first been delivered to the final consumers. Uh, for example, um, NAFTA imported for upgrading would be forced to be ported as imports of NAFTA, then it will be transferred as products like transfers of the refiner feedstocks for further processing. Notice here that the arrow is going into um, uh, this, uh, this supply side, meaning these quantities are adding into the supply of the total primary oil products. Now moving on to the uh, supply side of the secondary oil products. It all comes from these refinery plants as a refinery gross output. Some of them are used to operate those refinery plants, which we, uh, for which we collect data uh, for uh, refinery fuel. And inter-product transfers, uh, depending on its um, characteristics of uh, oil products, it can be reclassified into another type of um, secondary oil products. For this, we use this specific flow inter-product transfers. Um, here is uh, one um, simple schematic view uh, to show you some examples here, um, to show you that um, um, there is a tendency uh, of the convert, uh, reclassification. Uh, generally like inter-product um, transfers are more likely to happen from lighter to heavier oil products. Products transferred. Um, now we see again this products transferred. Um, this flow allows for the movements of the secondary oil products, which have not yet been delivered to the final consumers 
to be reported as feedstocks and to be reprocessed in the refinery. Uh, notice that uh, unlike in the earlier side, the arrow here uh, means that the oil products reported as products transferred are discounted from the supply of secondary oil products going to the inland deliveries because these go back in, as inputs into the refinery for further uh, processing. So it is deducted in, uh, from gross inland deliveries of secondary oil products. Primer product receipts. Um, one good example, again, is biofuels. If we um, mix blend some of the um, bio gasoline or ethanol uh, biodiesel into uh, motor gasoline or bio uh, non-bio gas diesel oil, we use this um, specific flow primary product receipts uh, because it uh, these biofuels doesn't go through the refinery process but it will be blended into the conventional oil products. Uh, recycled products. Um, yeah, if the uh, finished products that pass a second time through the marketing network after having been once um, delivered to the final consumers. Um, one, one good example is the used lubricants which are reprocessed, then all of these recycled products can be reported under this flow. And um, international marine bunkers, um, just like the other uh, fuels, if it is used for the international voyage, then we can separately report those amounts and trade uh, take place for secondary oil products and stock building and drawing also take place for secondary oil products. Um, using all of these components, we can derive uh, gross inland levers Here, uh, the, the benefit of having a balance, oil balance of transformation is that we can derive the efficiency of the refinery process. So using all of the input to the refinery uh, plant, we call, it, we call it refinery intake on the left-hand side, and using the refinery gross output, we can calculate if, if we have a refinery losses or gains. Here, the unit, is, um, unit matters because um, depending on which unit we are looking at, um, the final outcome can be uh, legit or, uh, or not. For example, mass unit, if you're using the mass units um, uh, or volume units, uh, it is depending on calorific values or um, the um, characteristics of oil products. Uh, we can have, we might have some refinery gains However, in terms of energy units, uh, we are expecting to, we are not expect, expecting to see a refinery gains. And uh, here uh, I put um, the, uh, the formula uh, to calculate the refinery yield. International marine bunkers, uh, it accounts for a large portion of the oil consumption. And uh, because as it as the name literally means that um, it shows uh, the the oil consumption uh, that is destined for international uh, travel or voyage, it matters because it is very important outlet for the refining refining industry, and um, eighty percent of global trade in physical goods is done by sea. So we can tell that it really consumes a large portion of the oil demand. And finally, it is, I, I want to highlight that the distinction between um, national and international navigation is very important because uh, it impacts on the final um, calculation of the emission inventories. So uh, what is consumed for international um, bunkers is, is excluded from national inventory calculation. When we look at the final consumption part, um, there are, depending on the specific properties of oil products, there are certain um, users or economic sectors that are using specific oil. Um, one good example, jet kerosene, uh, we are expecting mainly uh, to see it is mainly used by the aviation 
and gasoline, diesel, uh, road transport should be the uh, could like most likely to be the largest uh, largest consumer uh, among each sectors. And bitumen, for example, it is we're expecting it is mainly used for um, for non-energy use. Here, the picture shows the the paveway. So um, this is slide uh, where you can access to various um, outputs and reports analysis from the agency. And now uh, we've got to um, to arrive uh, to explain um, the key points for reporting annual oils. Uh, when it comes to the IA reporting system, we have joint annual questionnaire for oil, and it is composed of uh, various tables, as we see here, and it all connected to each other so that it can help us to validate the data and to make sure that the data reported in each table in the oil questionnaire and the data reported in each fuel questionnaire are all consistent. Um, here on the left-hand side, uh, we can see some arrows and relationship between renewables, coal, natural gas, and electricity and heat questionnaire with uh, oil questionnaire. Um, for this um, questionnaire um, thing, uh, we can have a like deep look at the exercise session. And here I just want to highlight uh, some uh, tricky um, issues that we are commonly facing. Uh, first, uh, which is the uh, reporting of natural gas liquids. So we call it NGL. Uh, and NGL is, um, it can be processed first of all in the refinery. It is one option. And refinery grows up, put up the final product, and the supply of as its NGL is reported respectively in table two and table one. And we have another case uh, where we consume NGL rather directly. And in that case, uh, we only uh, report uh, the this amount that is directly used under direct use uh, flow. And uh, as a result, because it doesn't go through the refinery process, in table 2A, we report that under primary product receipts flow. Uh, at the end, it, if it is reclassified into another product, then we can use flow called inter-product transfers. Another tricky um, reporting um, topic is relating to these uh, biofuel blended with other oil products. So most common example is bioethanol um, or biogasoline that is blended into motor gasoline. And if, um, if it is pure status of the biofuel, we only report that in the renewable questionnaire. However, um, if it is blended into conventional non-bio gasoline, motor gasoline, then um, the way that we report is slightly different. Uh, here, you can see the example and here on 100 um, kiloton of biofuels, First, um, in the oil questionnaire, uh, we report that under receipts from other sources because it is already treated in the renewable questionnaire. It can be imported from other countries or it can be produced in the uh, domestically. And since that 100 kiloton is already covered by the renewable questionnaire, in the oil questionnaire, uh, we report that under receipts from other sources. And in the in the secondary oil products, as a secondary oil products in table 2A, um, we again reported under primary product receipts. And uh, we have, a, a, by doing that, we can um, add up the two components, biogasoline and non-biogasoline to, to make a total more gasoline inland deliveries. 
we always check the consistency between these two so that it, we have a, a proper uh, accounting, especially for uh, biofuels. And final um, tricky point is how we report the data relating to the petrochemical flows. Um, as you know, like the petrochemical sector is evolving and they are not just um, consuming the energy products, but also they are producing um, energy products and or non-energy products. So uh, between refinery and gross inland deliveries, we have a specific table called table 2B, where we collect all the energy consumption to the petrochemical sector. And um, depending on uh, the final outcome, um, it could be the energy output that will be again um, used as a feedstocks to go through the refinery process. Uh, for this, uh, we have a specific flow here. Uh, we are looking at the uh, backflows to refineries, and this contributes again to the refinery, uh, refinery intake. Or it can be directly exported or sale without going through the refinery process. Uh, on the other hand, um, it also produces some non-energy use output, and this makes us to um, clearly um, uh, and correctly report uh, all the oil inputs for energy use and non-energy use. We report that in the oil balance. However, this non-energy output from the petrochemical plant, uh, we are not collecting the data. So net deliveries to petrochemical industry is calculated by subtracting the backflows to refineries from gross deliveries to petrochemical industry. So this, um, uh, this comes to my end of my presentation and I, I hope you like it. It's a bit uh, <laughs> complicated, but I'm really happy to receive any questions.